Welcome to the Student Ministry Podcast. This is episode 55, and I'm Steve Cullum, your host. And today we're going to be talking to Mike Haynes. And for those of you that have been listening to the podcast for a long time, you may recognize that name. Mike Haynes was actually on episode 32 as well. And at that time, we talked to him about his ministry there in Ashburn, Virginia. We talked to him about his G Shades curriculum, which has been a sponsor for the last year. And uh, today we're going to revisit some conversations, but really today the the goal is to talk about racial reconciliation. Um, A lot of what is going on in our world right now is so racially charged and just so much going on uh, around that. And I think a lot of us are wondering as as youth pastors, what do we do? Uh, How can we shepherd our students through all this? And how can we um, be a, a voice or how can we listen better? All those different things. And so I wanted to bring on, uh, bring on Mike, um, just because he's a, he's an amazing youth pastor. Um, but he also has perspective that I do not have, um, being, being a white, uh, youth pastor, um, he being, uh, an African American. So yeah, I'm so excited for, for you guys to hear today from Mike Haynes. He has some amazing, uh, insight and some amazing wisdom that he's going to share today. So it's a little bit of a a break from the norm. It's not going to be the kind of structure of the podcast that we normally have, uh, but I do encourage you to go back to episode 32, hear his ministry story as well. You don't necessarily have to do it before uh, before you listen to this one, but it will give a little bit more context. Uh, but before we jump into that conversation, I do want to thank you, number one, for tuning in, encourage you to follow us on social media. Also, uh, make sure you subscribe to the, hear the podcast every time it drops. We've been able to actually drop a little bit more often lately. I I know we we usually shoot for uh, once a month, but lately we've been able to actually have a couple episodes a month. So I hope you've been enjoying that. I've got another amazing one coming up in a couple weeks uh, that I'm really excited for you to hear as well. But uh, make sure you subscribe to it so you get it every time it drops. And one more thing I want to talk about before we jump into that conversation is our sponsor, G Shades. G Shades is a youth ministry curriculum and teaching strategy focused on helping students see everyday life situations through the lens of the gospel. Mike's going to talk about this a little later in the podcast, but since this this pandemic has hit so many churches hard financially, G-Shades is offering six months of their middle school and high school curriculum absolutely free starting on July 1st, 2020. Each series includes full video messages, teaching manuscripts, small group guides, parent guides, Instagram devotionals, games, graphic slides, and bumper videos. Six months of G-Shades premium subscription is usually $140, but G-Shades is offering it to you for $0 to help you win with your lead pastor while churches begin to recover from this pandemic. Remember, starting on July 1st, go to gshades.org to download six months of free youth ministry curriculum and tell a youth worker friend about this awesome gift so that their church can also benefit from this too. G-Shades, seeing life through the lens of the gospel. And now let's jump into this incredibly great conversation that I had with Mike Haynes. Hey, Mike, thanks so much for for being here today. And uh, you're actually, uh, I think... One of our first, if not the first, returning guests on the podcast. So thanks for being back. It feels good, man. It feels good. You know, it's one of those things where I'll probably call my mom later and, and let her know, like, I made it back. I'm a returning <laughs> guest. So she'll she'll be proud of me. It's nice. really cool. <laughs> yeah, you're actually one of your, uh, or the episode you were on was episode 32. And it is actually one of our highest listened episodes. So I mean, surpass I'm getting overwhelmed one. by the amount. <laughs> of things I need to tell my mom when I call her <laughs> after this. It is really cool that I, it's, I'm honored. Yeah. Nice. So, so yeah. So because people have heard your story or they should have heard your story already by listening to, to episode 32, but today uh, I brought Mike on just because of the current situation. A lot of times on the student ministry podcast, we really do. Um, we talk about stuff that, you know, it's, it's, it has to do with ministry and your ministry story and things like that. But uh, today I, I thought we'd tackle something that's very, um, 
real and what things are people are going through right now and how do we deal with that as a student ministry. So, um, yeah, so most of you probably know at the current time where we've always probably dealt with, um, with, with racism and, and stuff in our, in our country. But right now it just seems to be, a, a, the awareness is so heightened, um, about what's going on. And so I just thought like, let's, let's actually listen. Um, what we, I, I've been, told a whole lot, um, by other people. And as a, as a white guy, I'm like, I just need to listen. And so that's what I'm here today to do. And, uh, and yeah, I brought on Mike to just, uh, to listen to him. So Mike, like you've shared your ministry story, but I'd love to know, uh, what, what's your story as, as, as a black man growing up in this country and in your community and, and, have you had any experience with, with racism personally in your life? Yeah. So I, I'm glad you asked and, and I'm super excited to share uh, kind of my story, a couple of caveats beforehand. Uh, first of all, my story is not everyone's story who is black and lives in America. That's super important and super worth noting. Um, and so, but it is my story and I want to own that um, and never apologize for it just because it doesn't match the narrative of maybe somebody else who's grown up in this country. So um, if anyone listening, whose story is very different than mine, if you're able to show me some grace, um, just because my story might not be your story. And so I might not communicate some things that would be important for you to communicate only because my story is different than yours. Um, but I, it is my story and I want to own that. So uh, I grew up uh, in in upper middle class suburban neighborhood, um, everywhere that I've lived pretty much since I was uh, five and up has been uh, kind of upper middle class, reasonably diverse, but definitely tilting toward white. Um, and, and that's just worth noting. That's just, that's my background. Um, there have been so many times growing up where my mom and my dad, who kind of grew up inner city, um, a little bit uh, lower on the socioeconomic scale, have like told me, like, child, you grew up with a silver spoon in your mind. Right? And it's just, it's this thing of where I may not have white privilege, but I do come from a place of some privilege. And I think that's important for me to recognize. I um, mean, important for all of us to recognize that just because your privilege isn't racial, there might still be some privilege there um, that, you, that just is is something presuppositional to you. You don't even have to think about it. So that's just kind of part of my story. Um Kind of tangentially to that, uh, I have always just, it's just my personality. It's just who I am. Um, I have always been called an Oreo. Um, I've been called an Oreo by black people. I've been called an Oreo by white people. It just, it doesn't matter. It's just, and if, for those of you who aren't um, hip with lingo that may or may not still be relevant, I don't know. Um, being an Oreo is essentially, it's the idea of like, you're black on the outside, but you're white on the inside, just like an Oreo. Um, and I've been called that for, for, for my entire life. It's just kind of part of my personality. I just, I guess I put off this vibe of, of quote unquote whiteness, right? Whatever that means, that's kind of what people have said to me. And, and for the most part, I mean, I think when I was a kid, there were some things I had to work through with that of what that means and how do I, how do I still, do I still belong within my race group if people don't think I'm quote unquote black enough. That's more identity stuff than it is uh, necessarily racial tension or racial reconciliation. That's just some identity formation I had to go through uh, growing up. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that I have experienced with that, right, is that there have been occasions um, throughout my life when I was a kid, teenager, and grown man now where people, it's been clear that when they say you're an Oreo, what's really being communicated to me is, Oh, you're you're more white. You're, you're like really white on the inside. You're one of the good ones. You're one of the mm. good blacks. You're one of the good black people, the non-threatening black people. Um, and I think that that's it's so subtle, right? But it's mm. and it's not that anyone's ever said that to me out loud specifically, right? But you can just tell sometimes by the intonations, by the connotation, right? That for them, it's this. I was scared of you. I was threatened by you. And then I found out, oh no, you're, you're, you, you act kind of really white. So now I don't have to be afraid of you anymore. Right. And that's this cultural people feeling culturally uncomfortable with black. Right. And so because they feel culturally uncomfortable with black culture or black people, then anything that is black is a threat until it's not. Um, and so that's definitely one form of racism that I've, I've experienced in my life. Um, that again, kind of mild, but still definitely a thing. Um, and, uh, and so anyways, um, I've never experienced police brutality or anything of that nature. Uh, but back when I was a teenager, um, I was on my way to a friend's house 
uh, we were going to, he was a college, a college buddy of mine. I was a freshman in college. And so he was a college buddy of mine. And, um, and we both happened to live in roughly the same area. So we were home from school and I borrowed my mom's car to go and go to his house. And we we're going to do a sleepover and, and hang out and, and study the Bible, honestly, because we were both a bunch of Christian nerds. And that's what you do at a sleepover when you go to Bible college together. Um, and so we were, you know, I brought my Bible because I thought we were going to dig in and I got lost. Um, I got lost on my way there. This was kind of before iPhones were, were a big thing. And so I just, GPS wasn't really working out that well. And I wound up getting lost. And I kind of was in this back area, not really on a main road, trying to figure out how to get out. Um, and while I was in that back area, I got pulled over by a police officer for absolutely no reason. Um, and so the police officer pulled me over and, uh, you know, just respectful drivers, you know, license registration, all that kind of stuff. I explained, this is my mom's car. Um, and, and the police officer continued to line, basically went down a line of questioning of like, so there's a lot of drug deals that happen back here. Are you a drug dealer? You know, are you, are you sure you're not a drug dealer? And I'm like, no, I'm not a drug. No, I'm not a drug dealer, right? Because I'm driving my mom's car. My mom at the time had a Jaguar. And so for this police officer, they see young black driving a Jaguar. And they're like, what? Yeah, he's got to be a drug dealer. And so for me in the time, right? I'm like, no, I'm not a drug dealer. I have my Bible in my backpack. Do you want <laughs> to see it? You know, right? Like it's, it's right here. I'm getting ready to go like study the Bible with my friends for fun in my off time. I'm not a drug dealer, right? But that's just one of those things where there's this profiling, there's this, this you're a threat until you're not if you're black, right? If you're black, there's, it's, it's, it's in a lot of cases, not all cases, this isn't true of everybody, but there have definitely been some instances in my life where I've experienced you are assumed guilty until you prove that you're innocent. You prove that you're one of the good ones. Um, and so that's just, that's a, a barrier that black people in this country have had to overcome for a very, very long time. Um, so, so a, another instance where, where I, I've definitely been racially profiled um, is, you know, I've been in a store before and had the owner, the store owner follow me around because they assumed that I was going to steal something, right? I'm not going to steal anything. I have, I have no intention of stealing anything. I've never stolen anything in my life. When I was six, actually, side note, when I was six, I did accidentally steal a cookie from CVS. Um, I just, I put it in my pocket and forgot to give it to my dad to pay for it. And I felt really bad. So I went back and, um, and apologized and, and paid for the cookie. Um, that was, it was awful. I cried. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the instance in my life of like, that's, that's what stealing is to me. It's just something you don't do. Um, but because I'm black, right. The assumption is oh, you're, you look like you're up to no good. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's definitely something I've dealt with before. I've seen, I've seen women, right? This is, this is just these small things, right? I've seen women clutch their purse when they're walking by me on the street. I notice that stuff. I notice when I'm walking down the street and someone moves to the opposite side of the street when they see me coming, right? It's just, it's assumed I'm a threat until I prove that I'm not because mm -hmm. I'm black. Um, you know, I've, I've, and this is a, a very kind of a specific example that's probably not true of ev a lot of people, but just in my particular context, right? Like, at a previous church that I worked at, you know, I was the youth pastor at that church overseeing middle and high school. And, you know, I got called into, you know, my boss's office, one of the pastors on staff. And they were basically telling me like, cause I, I'd worn braids, right. I, I put my hair in braids. Um, and they were basically telling me like, you can't wear braids. Um, you can't wear braids. They were like, you can't wear braids because if you wear braids, then everyone in our church is, or not everyone, but a lot of people in our church, are going to see you as a threat. They're going to perceive you as a thug. And so mm. you, you don't, it is not wise for you to wear braids because if you wear braids as a black person, well, now you're a thug. And, and we just don't want that on, we don't want to have, we don't want to deal with that on staff. Right. And so it's just, just these instances where it's just, gosh, you know, that's, it just doesn't feel, doesn't sit right with me. Right. That, that I'm yeah. perceived guilty um, until proven innocent. So, you know, the deal is, you know, none of this stuff, none of the experiences of racism in my life, and there have been more, um, but I don't want to just go on and on about it, but um, none of this stuff holds a candle, right, to what happened to Freddie Gray or Ahmaud Arbery or George Floyd or, or any of the people who have been, you know, murdered over the past few years, right? None of, none of the stuff that I've experienced really holds a candle to that. All of that stuff is way, way worse, way bigger of a deal, way more of an injustice, but I think that's part of the problem. 
right? I think part of the problem is our country takes real big notice when these grand atrocities, atrocities happen, right? And we should take notice. We should take notice of them. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but racism isn't just demonstrated in a cop kneeling on a man until he dies, right? That's the stuff that it gets national and international attention, and it should. Um, but the smaller ways, the, the little, just the little microaggressions and the little ways that racism is displayed, um, it, it, that happens every day. And, and it's kind of culturally accepted um, as not that big of a deal because it's so imp- it's 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 almost tough to perceive. There's so many people who I think have these biases and these these kinds of uh, you know little things about them, and and they might not even recognize it in themselves because they're so small. And I think that's one of the issues that we're kind of getting around to in our country is like. Yes, it's about Ahmaud Arbery. Yes, it's about you know Freddie Gray. And yes, it's about George Floyd and, and all of the others. But also, this goes a lot deeper than killing people. This is this is a real heart issue, and it displays itself in very small ways because the enemy is real and he's active. Um, so that that's kind of my story with racism and, and kind of just what I've seen from my own experience. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think that's one of the one of the things what you hit at at the end is is one of the things my wife and I are are learning right now is because I think we had the probably the the wrong definition of racism. Um, and I, and we're learning that there's, there's some different definitions out there that people are using that, that have been changing our outlook, um, especially around systematic racism and things that are just a, a part of our country and a part that, that we're learning a lot right now, which is, is crazy. Cause I don't think, you know, we don't think of ourselves as, as treating people differently. Um, but there are just some systems that are a part of our country that, that are really, really deep. And, and, and they do influence us in small ways. And, and it may not be, you know, we're not murdering, you know, black people on the streets, but, but do we treat them differently? Do we look at them differently? Do we, those small things that do eventually add up. And so, um, so I know a lot of our students are seeing this stuff Um, as, as youth pastors, you know, we were working with a bunch of teenagers that I, I think, Gen Z and I think Gen Alpha probably behind them are really in tune to injustice and they, they want to fix this. They want, they know it's wrong. Um, but how, how do you think the response should be for us youth pastors and our students? How can we actually shepherd them, uh, through all these different racial issues in our country? Yeah. You know, I'm glad you asked the question because it's actually not that it's not always intuitive for those of us who are from maybe some older generations, particularly if you're kind of above that millennial line, then sometimes it might feel like, um, it might feel like you have to teach students or we really need to go over the fact that, right, all people are created equal and all that kind of stuff. It's funny, like in previous generations that had to be in like, hey, this is the biblical truth that this generation needs to understand. Mm-hmm. And, and we're at a point now where it's sometimes I look around and I'm like, I don't know that we have to teach students this. I mean, we should. We should teach the whole counsel of God. However, um, it it almost feels like we're now raising up a generation who just intuitively, they just intuitively seem to get it, right? They just intuitively, this biblical idea, whether they believe in Jesus or not, it's just this idea of equality is something this generation and the generation to come, they don't struggle with that at all. So then the question is, how do we lead them, right? How do we inform them? How do we teach them um, when it comes to Christian doctrine and what God has to say and what the Bible has to say about these things? How do we shepherd them in the midst of stuff like this? And so, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm this enormous believer. It's, it's like my whole thing, right? I'm an enormous believer that our best response to any situation in life is going to come when we see it through the lens of the gospel, Right. And, and I don't think a gospel lens always directs us with specific actions. I don't think seeing something through the lens of the gospel, how has God treated us in the context of the gospel through Christ or how has God uh, just acted in the gospel narrative? Right. I don't I don't when we see things through that lens, I don't think that's always going to tell us exactly what to do, um, which can be frustrating because most of us are people who we want to know, OK, what? give me a three step list. Right. What's step one, two and three? What do you want me to do, God? Right. But instead. I think what the a gospel lens is, is it informs the way that we see, right? If we see things clearly, I think seeing things clearly, seeing things through the gospel, the lens of the gospel, I think that informs our response on any given issue. Um, and so when I think, I think when it comes to students asking us, asking you as a youth pastor, right, what, what's your response? What's your reaction? What should our reactions be to the racial issues in our country? Right? I think our job as youth pastors is to point them to the gospel and, and have and kind of help them see this whole racial injustice issue through the lens 
of the gospel. I just think that's, that's our job as youth pastors right now. That's so good. And, and I know that, yeah, like that's, that's what you're all about, which is so awesome. Um, so could you provide some examples of that? Like seeing racial injustice in our world through that, that lens of the gospel, how can we actually pass that on to our students? Yeah, that's great. It, it, because it is one of those things where it's like, okay, well, that sounds good, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it sounds great. Sure. But what do you mean? Um, and so you know, I'll give you an example, right? In the context of the gospel, God places this enormous value on justice, right? That's why Jesus had to come in the first place because the penalty for sin had to be paid, right? Justice had to be served. And so God places this enormous value on justice in the context of the gospel. But he also places this enormous value on reconciliation in the context of the gospel. It's not just one or the other, it's both. It's both justice and reconciliation at the same time, right? That we pursue those things both as as really important. And so I think a gospel lens, seeing racial uh, injustice and, and reconciliation, racial issues through the lens of the gospel, that will lead us to place a high value on both justice and reconciliation when it comes to this issue. And I think particularly for students who are still, you know, who can be very emotionally charged, it's really, it's gonna be really easy for a lot of our students to just place value on justice, Mm -hmm. right? And that's good, we see that and we're like, yeah, that's so good. But I think a gospel lens will lead us to also place an incredibly high value on racial, or on reconciliation when it comes Mm -hmm. to racial injustice. Um, And so that means that we don't, we don't, We don't take revenge, right? We're not interested in taking revenge. We're not interested in punishing everybody involved just to punish them, right? That's that's placing a high value on justice, but it's not necessarily placing a high value on reconciliation and both are what the gospel would inform us to do. Um, And so here's what I think that means. I think that means that we'll encourage students not to draw lines in the sand, right? None, None of this like, well, if you didn't post for Blackout Tuesday, then I'm unfriending you on social media nonsense, right? That's, that's, I, I understand why people, feel that way. I get it. I really do. I'm angry. My heart is burdened, right, for what's going on. I, I, there's, it, my heart is heavy and burdened when I see a friend of mine who just doesn't seem to get it, right, when it comes to racial stuff. But I just think the gospel leads us toward a passion for justice and a radical passion for pursuing reconciliation. And so that means that we don't draw lines in the sand and we don't, we don't cut off our friends just because they don't see this the same way we do or because they don't have the same passion for justice that we do because reconciliation also matters in the context of the gospel. And that's what we're meant to pursue is a gospel lifestyle. And so even when others don't feel or see this issue as clearly as we do, I think it's important that we pursue justice, yes, but also reconciliation. Both matter, and, and God placed a high value on both when he sent Jesus uh, to die for us. Oh, Mike, that was so good. <laughs> like, seriously, like, like Mike drops all over the place. Like, I learned so much because that's, I feel like that that's so incredibly important because, because the justice is being so important and, and, and we have to achieve all that, but, but that reconciliation thing that Jesus is all about is, is just as crucial. And I, I think that's one of the things that it, it seems like we're, we're missing in, in the middle of all this. So if we can, yeah, if we can get teenagers out there pursuing both, like, that's amazing. I, I, I hasten to ask because I've, I, you've dropped some wisdom already, but what's another example? I'm after some free stuff here. <laughs> like, like, what's some other examples? What else can we, how can we shepherd our students in this? Because um, I'm sure that there's so much more in your brain. You got, you got anything else you'd like to share? Yeah. I mean, I, it's, I've spent so much time thinking about this, particularly in the past week and just, just talking to the Lord about it, trying to figure out what's going on in my own heart. Uh, because again, like as a black man in this country, I have a black son. Right. And so for me, there is definitely, I needed to go to Jesus about this, right? And say, God, can you equip me with a gospel lens? Because I would be, because I'm angry, right? I'm angry and I'm sad and I'm heartbroken. And, and there's, there's, it would be easy for me to look at this and go, man, this has been a 65, 75, I mean, it goes all the way back to the beginning of our country, right? This, this struggle for, for racial equality and we're still not there. It's been hundreds of years and this is still happening. So it's easy for me as, as a black man in this country and with a black son who, you know, now I'm like, well, gosh, I gotta, you know, I gotta help my kid navigate this. I gotta pray to the Lord mm-hmm. that, that my kid's gonna be okay, that I'm gonna be okay, right? When yeah. I encounter uh, authority figures in the future. And so um, I, I definitely have had to do 
some some soul searching and, and asking God to equip me with the gospel lens or else I could react really unhealthy in this area. Um, and so I, I'll give you another one that, that's kind of come to me recently as I've been talking to Jesus. You know, I think a gospel lens leads us toward hope um, and a sense of peace, even in the midst of earthly injustice, right? Because the gospel is super, super, super clear. Nobody ever really gets away with anything. Um, eternal justice will be carried out one way or another on every living person, right? From the police officers who murder black people in the streets to the person who just calls a black person the N-word under their breath quietly to themselves, right? And everything in between. Either they will experience justice in a final sense from God on judgment day, or God's wrath on their sin was placed on Jesus, and justice has been served in an eternal sense. No one really gets away with anything. And for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, like if we look at the fact that maybe, maybe, they're ju- maybe for some people, their justice, the justice that has been served to them for these actions was carried out just for, for racial, you know, whatever, for racism, the justice for that was carried out on the cross because it's either in the past or in the future, they place their trust in Jesus. If that makes us mad, if that feels like it's just, well, they got away with it, right? How dare they get away with it? I think that's a heart check because we get away with stuff all the time. If it's that, if Jesus delivering justice, fulfilling the, the, the penalty for our sin, if that doesn't count as justice, for racism, then it doesn't count as justice for your lust problem. And it doesn't count as justice for, for, your, for your greed. It doesn't count as justice for your pride issue, right? It, it, it has to count as justice across the board. And if we can't get ourselves to accept that gospel reality as our reality, then I think we have to ask ourselves, we have to really do some self-reflection about how real is the gospel to me? How, how real is that in the way that I perceive the world around me? Eternity matters. It matters so much in Christianity and it matters so much in the real world around us. And so I think seeing this through the lens of the gospel will allow us to have some hope. It'll allow us to have some peace that even in areas, even in senses, even in moments where justice isn't quite carried out the way that it should be here on earth, nobody ever gets away with anything because God is a just judge and he's really good at his job. And so I think that just allows us to have a higher, le- as Christians, I think that allows us to have a higher level of peace, even in the midst of our anger over injustice. And I think our job as youth pastors is to kind of help our kids see through that lens, too, or to help our students see through that lens, because that's not necessarily intuitive, but it is true. And if it's true, then we should preach it as true and we should we should help them to see that. So that's that's another another kind of gospel lens that you could throw on over your eyes to help you see this through the right lens and to help students see this issue through the right lens. Oh, that's so good. So good. All right. So we're we're helping students see through the lens of the gospel, but do you think there's some other ways that we can point students to being a part of that solution when it comes to racial reconciliation? Because I think that's that's a huge piece of what I feel like you're you're really hitting at a lot today. Um, you know, the the seeking after justice comes naturally to them. But how can we also help them to to focus on being a part of the solution when it comes to the reconciliation part? Oh, it's great. I, I'll touch on the, the justice part real quick first. You know, I think, um, you know, I found there's some really cool, you know, great petitions that are floating around, online petitions, real easy to sign. Um, and there's all kinds of ones out there. Obviously, you know, we want to encourage students or we want to do our homework before we point students to a particular petition because we want to make sure that we're signing our name on something that is actually pursuing the right thing or is coming from the right perspective. Um, but there are some really great petitions, really easy to sign, and they're floating around on social media everywhere. And so, um, I, you know, I think one thing we should be doing as youth pastors is encourage students to sign um, some of those petitions, encourage them to have their voice be heard. And I'll, I'll share in a minute uh, just a really cool resource for that online resource where you can kind of see a lot of those petitions gathered in one spot, just makes it real easy um, to, to get uh, some of those signed and just to have our voices heard as American citizens. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of protests that are going on. Um, and I think, you know, we have to be careful. Um, you know, again, we pursue justice, uh, but we also have to have wisdom. And so I think we, we need to be careful as youth pastors about encouraging minors to attend protests, right? I think, you know, it depends on, on where you live. It depends on your particular context. It depends on what the, the environment of that protest has been like in the past you know, week or so. Um, but I think, you know, depending on where you live, depending on your context, 
it, it might make some sense. It might make some sense to encourage students to, to attend a protest um, accompanied by an adult, right? That might make some sense in some cases. It just kind of depends on where you are, uh, have wisdom, has, have discernment when it comes to that kind of stuff mm. um, and encouraging students to get involved in that way. But I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing, and you talked about this at the, at the top of the show, right? The biggest thing that all of us can do, me included, because just because I'm black doesn't mean that there's no bias there. There's no, right, that, that nothing exists, right? It might not be about black people, right? But it might be about, you know, people who are from the Hispanic community, right? Or it might be people from the LGBTQ community, right? Just bias mm-hmm. exists everywhere. And so I think one of the biggest things we can all do in this season is to take inventory of our own heart, right? And so we should lead students um, to take some inventory of their heart, which fortunately, I mean, not not really fortunately, this whole situation with COVID-19 is very unfortunate, but one of the benefits, one of the ways that, that there's a lot of redemption in it is that students have more time to sit and think <laughs> and reflect and pray and journal than they have ever had in their entire lifetime. And so if we, one of the things we can lead students to do is to sit and think and journal and reflect and pray about their own heart, right? And asking God, asking the Holy Spirit to speak into that. And I think when we allow Jesus into those spaces to show us where there might be some brokenness, I think that's a hugely important and ongoing process for each and every one of us. So I think that's another thing that we need to do. And then of course, this is something that's just going around and, and it seems like people get it, right? This is one of those things I'm like on social media, I'm talking to friends, right? And, and it just feels like we get it. Like we need to listen. We, we gotta listen. Um, we gotta, it's so important, particularly if you're not part of the black community, it's so important to take the time to sit and listen. And it might be weird. It might be weird going to a black friend and going, Hey, can you just tell me about your experience, right? That it feels weird. It feels like putting them on the spot. I get that. But I do think it's really important that we take the time to walk in someone else's shoes and just live in their story for a bit so that we can have a better perspective and, and not wind up tripping ourselves up and making fools of ourselves because we say things out of ignorance, right? That's, it's not your fault. If you, it's not your fault you were born white. It's not your fault you were born non-black, right? That's not your fault. But there are some steps that we need to take in that case um, just to kind of help us relate to people better. So. Yeah. That's what I, I feel. I feel like that I've been learning a lot is, is perspective. Perspective is huge. And, and I don't know the things that I don't know. And, and there's been times that I've, I've been to orange conference the last couple of years, you know, has really hit on racial reconciliation stuff. And, and I, and I remember sitting there going, Oh, that's, that's not me. Like I have black friends. I have Hispanic friends. Like I love all people. Like there's not, there's not a problem. And then it wasn't until recently that I started going, you know, there are probably things that are just ingrained in me that, that I'm not consciously, you know, treating people differently, but they're, they're there. And then to start to see like, there are some systematic stuff that is part of our culture and, and how can we, first we get to recognize that it's there. And I think that's huge by just asking the questions. And so I've went to my Hispanic friends. I went to my black friends. I went to my Asian friends. I'm like, all right, that I'm, this is, this may be just awkward. I'm going to embrace the awkward. Um, I need to hear your story. I need to, I need to know at least hear from you. What is it like to walk in this world in your shoes? What do you experience that I don't see on a regular basis? Um, so, so beyond that, beyond talking to them, do you have any other resources that you could help students that we could point students to, to, to help them get involved or just learn about racial injustice and reconciliation in our country? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do. And, and, you know, this is, I'm just going to have a couple because I don't, I don't want to, um, sometimes I think simplicity is, is better in some instances, it's just one or two really great resources is better than uh, here's 3000 of them. Um, and so just a couple that I, I've seen that I think are really neat. Um, I, I learned about this organization pretty recently, uh, but they're called Be the Bridge Youth. Uh, and they do an awesome job equipping students to be agents of change for racial reconciliation in their communities. And that's be the bridge.com. And if you just go, you'll find the, a link to their website in the show notes, but um, that, that might be a really great place for youth pastors and students to start. If you're just looking for like, what, what would it look like if we decided to adopt this as something we really wanted to get involved in, in our youth ministry or for a particular student just wanted to take this on as a passion project. How do I help? Um, they, they do an amazing job at be the bridge youth. Um, and so I'll, I'll plug that they do an awesome job. So uh, go check out uh, be the bridge youth or be the bridge.com. 
Um, and then additionally, um, a high school student created a website that has incredibly helpful and practical, practical links uh, to petitions, to donation pages, uh, maps of where protests are being held, right? It's just kind of, it's very all inclusive. Um, it's very, very thorough, um, all of that stuff, right? And so that website is blacklivesmatter.card and that's C-A-R-R-D dot co and that'll also be in the show notes because that's a tricky link right there but that'll also be in the show notes um and so it, that's a, a really just a really cool resource for again the petitions in particular um finding out where protests are being held if students or families uh preferably decide they want to go um and attend one of those that's a great resource for that cool Thanks so much for that. Yeah. And a book that I'm reading right now, my wife and I just started it. Um, it it's not a Christian book, um, but uh, but from the the portion that we have read so far, we're probably about like a quarter of the way through it. It's called White Fragility. It's actually one of the New York Times bestsellers or whatever. And uh, and I think from from a youth worker standpoint, at least um, from adults, I don't know if it's appropriate for, for students or, or not yet, but uh, from an adult perspective, it's it's great. It's been great for me to to learn things that I didn't know and see things from a different perspective. And and you may not agree with everything they say, but it's sometimes it's it's great to to read those things you may not agree with with everything and just to, to gain that perspective for sure. Um, Mike, I know you have uh, been doing some awesome stuff in terms of your curriculum and everything. So I want to give you a chance to to talk about that. Uh, you've been a uh, a sponsor of this podcast for for the last year, and we are incredibly grateful for that. Um, but I know that you're you're doing something special in light of all the COVID stuff, and uh, you've got some some different things planned, some big things planned for your for your cur- curriculum. And so, um, would you please talk about G Shades a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so again, this, you know, listen to this episode, it's pretty clear that I'm, I'm a big believer in seeing life through the lens of the gospel. And so a couple of years ago, I launched a, a youth ministry curriculum uh, focused on, on, on helping students see life through the lens of the gospel. It's every message is just, it's just about the gospel narrative. And it's about helping students see life through that lens when it comes to various topics. And so um, we're just, you know, trying to cover and it's me and, and there's some writers out there who are helping too. Um, and, and we're just trying to, to help cover a lot of those topics and to, to create a nice strategy for helping students see life differently and helping them see through the lens of the gospel that every time they encounter something in life, a situation, um, th- that they would be able to just kind of go, well, well, where do I see this reflected in the gospel? And that that would inform them on how to navigate that situation. Um, another way that I would explain it before I kind of talk about what, what we're doing specifically this for the rest of this year, um, another way I would explain it is every single one of us has an internal narrative, right? We all have an internal narrative and that internal narrative, that voice, that ongoing monologue in our head, um, that informs us on how we perceive things, that informs us on how we act, it informs our attitudes, our actions, all of that. Um, And I just, I just wonder why shouldn't our internal narrative be the gospel narrative? Well, why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't the gospel narrative be our reality? Like, why shouldn't it determine the way that we handle things? I know you, you know, you've got your lens, you've got your experiences. I know you've got your past, and I'm not trying to discount any of that stuff. That stuff is important. But at the end of the day, your experiences, your past experiences in life, shouldn't inform your actions and attitudes and who you are as a person more than the gospel narrative. The gospel, that's, that's what, that's what it means to trust in Jesus and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right. And so that this is what this curriculum is focused on. Um, it's very, very specifically focused on the gospel. Um, and, and every single week we're going to cover it. And so if you're a youth pastor that loves, loves, loves doing the altar calls, um, you, you, uh, every week, right? Whatever you want to, right? Because we're talking about the cross or some aspect of the gospel every single week. Um, and so, uh, so, so what we're doing, um, we've been doing that for a couple of years and, and I love it. And it's, it's a huge passion project of mine. I'm a full-time youth pastor. Um, that's my job, but G shades is just something I do on the side and I, and I freaking love it. But what we're doing, um, July through, uh, through October is when we're offering it, but we're just offering six months of our premium, curriculum package and we're offering it completely free um, and the reason that we're offering it completely free is because COVID-19 is no joke and, and economically uh, I know that there are a lot of churches out there that have taken a huge hit and when churches take a huge hit the first department to feel the effects of that is the youth ministry department and so I just I just decided like you know absolutely you know I, I definitely this is a business and I, and I love you know being able to provide it and being able to hopefully provide for my family some but right now 
I just want to help youth pastors win with their lead pastors. I want you to be able to go to your lead pastor and say, hey, so you know the curriculum budget? Yeah, we don't have to. You can you can use that to serve the community. You can use that to donate to Black Lives Matter. You can use that to do, right? I just, I think that's going to be really helpful um, for, for churches in this season. So we're offering a six month package that's, that drops in July. July 1st is when we're going to drop it. And that's just going to, that goes, that'll take you all the way through uh, December or January. And, uh, and that offer extends through October. We'll pull it in October and prepare for the next kind of subscription that we're, we're, we're getting ready to throw out in the new year. Um, but yeah, and so that curriculum, it's, it's, it's really, really good. I'm a little biased, but um, I, it's a really, really good curriculum. It's really well written. Um, and uh, that, that includes, it's, 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 it's premium. I mean, it's, it's video messages, full video messages, full message manuscripts. Um, it's, it's small group guides. It's parent guides. It's, it's your ministry leader guide to kind of give you a heads up, a rundown of the whole series. It's Instagram, you know, digital devotionals, right? Five, five days a week. Um, and so it's, it's just got the stuff. It's the slides and the bumper videos, right? It's all the things that we like using as youth pastors. It's just kind of, and so if it fits your context, use it. And if it doesn't, you still have the content, right? And that's great. Um, so anyways, we're offering that starting July 1st. I'm really, really excited to give that out completely free. And I'm hoping that a lot of youth pastors will use it, that it'll be helpful um, in that it'll help uh, spread the word even for, for lots of youth pastors who don't know G-Shades exists, right? To just help them, help students see life through lens of the gospel. So I'm really, really excited to give that out. And that's gshades.org uh, is where you can find uh, all of the, the things for that and download that when the time comes in July. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, definitely check that out. And I think especially in light of what you've shared today, I mean, like we need to, we need to start, you know, pumping the gospel even more and helping students see, see everything through the lens of that. And especially what's going on in our world today. Um, so that's going to be a, a huge benefit. I know to a, to a lot of youth workers out there. So thanks so much for doing that. Um, Mike, they got gshades.org, but what other ways can people find you? I'm sure that they're going to have a lot of questions and uh, I hope you're not like bombarded by too many people uh, asking a lot of questions uh, right now. But, uh, but I know some people are going to want to I want to follow up with him. I want to I want to ask him a, a few more questions. I want to want to see how he's doing during all this. Um, where can people find you online? How can they connect with you? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, honestly, the, the best uh, platform is is probably going to be Instagram. Um, and so I'm, I'm just at Mike. E. Haynes on Instagram, and that'll be in the show notes as well. Um, but yeah, find me there. Follow me. You can become one of my uh, six followers, um, and and I would love you know follow you back, and we, we can have a conversation. I would love 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 connecting with youth pastors and just getting the chance to talk about ministry and life and how things are going. So find me on Instagram, and that's a great great platform to do that. Well, thanks again so much for being our first returning guest, and uh, thanks so much for sharing some of your personal story today. Um, I know we kind of derailed a little bit from the regular ministry conversation, but I think it's so crucial um, that we do this and not only on this podcast, but we keep doing this, um, have those conversations in your, in your personal lives as well. So thanks Mike for, for being here today and for uh, helping me hopefully set the example of, of what we can be doing during this time and um, may God bless your ministry. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate you having me on. This is a really good time, and I hope we can do it again. I'd love to become a three-time champion. Ooh, I have to come up with like a special jacket or something like that. I don't know. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know many have used the word unprecedented about the times that we've been in over the last several months with the pandemic and now all the, the racial stuff that's on top of this, things that have been uh, existing in our world for a really long time, but it's just kind of uh, risen to the surface um, in a lot of our awareness over the last few weeks and months. And, uh, and I know a lot of other youth pastors are just wondering, how do I, how do I deal with all this? How do I walk through all this with my students? And I hope you are taking diligent notes today as Mike was sharing just some amazing wisdom on how we can have those conversations with our students, how we can shepherd them well, and how we can set them up to actually make some changes in our world, the changes that God wants to make through them. Um, you all know, uh, that's why you're in youth ministry. Um, you all know that the, there's so much power in this next generation. There's so much potential in this next generation. And uh, I just want to encourage you to keep after it, keep going, keep going. Um, and, uh, and 
God's going to do great things through you. God's going to do great things through the students that he has given you to lead. Um, but uh, thanks again for G Shades for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Again, remember to go to gshades.org, especially on July 1st, uh, 2020. You can download six months free curriculum. Six months. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Mike, for doing this for the youth ministry uh, community. And thanks for being on here today. If you haven't subscribed to us, be sure to do that. If you haven't left us a positive review on your favorite podcast app, be sure to do that. And be sure to also uh, follow us on social media. Follow me on social media. If there's someone I need to talk to for a future episode, let me know. But until next time, may God bless your ministry.